This is Professor Wes Porter, and this is the Concept and Rules of Evidence, a YouTube series. Today we're talking about Article 4, uh, specifically Rule 403, arguing the scales, the balancing test in Rule 403. Uh, essentially, we know in law school that there are plenty of balancing tests and times when we let the, the court weigh different equities when deciding matters. Well, this is keep sight of the fact that it's a uh, an evidentiary matter, that we're deciding whether certain evidence is going to be allowed into evidence, that we're going to allow uh, most oftentimes a jury to hear this evidence. Uh, and what this rule does is essentially force us to balance uh, how important the evidence is, uh, how how much it moves the ball forward in the proponent's case, something that the rules label as pro probative value. Not relevance, but probative value. How important is it? Weighing of that versus a number of dangers set out in the rule. And if the dangers, uh, unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, uh, cumulative waste of time, if those dangers substantially outweigh uh, how important the evidence is, that probative value of the evidence, then we're going to let the court in its discretion decide that it can keep some of this evidence out. Let's talk about it. Here's what the rule says. And you notice it says, although relevant. It starts out with although relevant. And the reason for that is simple. It's already cleared that first hurdle. It's cleared that very liberal evidentiary hurdle that we know about. This evidence has, as we learned in 401, some tendency uh, to make uh, a fact of consequence more or less probable than it would be without that evidence. It's a very low threshold. Any tendency at all to have any fact of consequence. So we expect a lot of evidence to uh, overcome the relevance hurdle. It's a liberal standard and a very low hurdle. But this is saying even the stuff that clears that first hurdle, that 401 hurdle, <coughs> evidence may be excluded if it's probative value. Now I want you to notice this sentence. We are giving a different label as we do throughout the rules. Um, to sort of something that's measuring the same thing. Relevance, I want you to think about as a light switch. Relevance is either on or off. It's relevant or irrelevant. And if it meets that liberal definition of 401, it's relevant. When we quantify, when we weigh how important something is, uh, we call it probative value. So you never say something is extremely relevant or highly relevant or uh, you never weigh something's relevance, either relevant or irrelevant. When you start to weigh it, you talk about its probative value under this rule. And what are we weighing it against? Well, these dangers that are set out in the rule. And notice that this rule only goes one way. We're talking about probative value, how important the evidence is when we're weighing uh, its effect. It has to be substantially outweighed by one of these. So you can imagine that scale tipped drastically sideways. It must be substantially outweighed. Not outweighed, substantially outweighed by one of the the rules. And essentially they set out six dangers um, and I put in red unfair prejudice. Unfair prejudice is the number one use that attorneys make of this rule waiting for trial. So the unfair prejudice must substantially outweigh, must be the thing that uh, far outweighs uh, that probative value of the evidence for the judge to exercise their discretion and keep it out. So you can imagine most evidence is relevant, it's going to be in. And this, only in certain instances, only when one of these dangers, most notably unfair prejudice, substantially outweighs the probative value of the evidence, will we keep it out. So this is a rule of inclusion. We expect most evidence to stay in. Only the rare instances where one of these dangers, unfair prejudice, substantially outweighs that probative value, will we exercise the court's discretion. Now, one of the questions I get all the time is, you know, what is unfair prejudice? Uh, you tell us, Professor Porter, that it's not everything that's unfair or not everything that's un that's prejudicial at trial, only unfair prejudice. And I would suggest to you that uh, the courts have dealt with this in sort of a hot and cold way. Essentially, we want juries to decide based things on a neutral evaluation of the evidence. We want a cold evaluation. We want them to look at the evidence, weigh the evidence, and come up with their verdicts. We don't want it to be based on sort of emotions or emotional reactions to evidence. Uh, you know, you can see the hot and cold right there. We want you to base it on the evidence, not be overcome by emotions. Now, of course, you're sitting as a jury. In certain cases, you're going to have emotions. You're going to have emotional reactions. But we're trying with this rule to minimize um, too much of the emotion that comes into a jury's decision at trial. Evidence should not, and you'll hear this phrase all the time in, 
you can see why we use emotions and hot. We should not inflame the passions of the jury. Don't show us things that are so offensive and so disgusting and so uh, unfair that we can't give uh, this criminal defendant or this civil defendant um, uh, you know, a neutral evaluation of the evidence because we're so angry based on the images that we've seen. Uh, it shouldn't be admitted. It shouldn't not be permitted only or admitted only to evoke this emotional reaction for the jury. Uh, but if it's uh, got some probative value, if it's got something that we can actually weigh, it actually goes to a fact of consequence that we're that we're thinking about. It has value in our case, uh, connected to things that matter in our case. Then it's not admitted only for that purpose, and it might not be what the the jury exercises discretion to exclude. So let's look at this scale. Um, it's not going to look like this when you argue 403. It only goes one way. And that one way is really pushing up. If you are the, particularly, you're the opponent, you're the one arguing uh, 403, you're saying the proponent is doing something that has unfair prejudice or one of these other dangers, you have to dial it up and articulate in your argument what's unfair and what's unfairly prejudicial about it. They are trying to introduce these 37 crime scene photos that show blood and gore and horror, and it's just to be unfairly prejudicial. Um, so we really have to dial it up and make sure that scale is high in the air. Similarly, uh, the flip side of the argument, and I suggest the second part of the argument, is to argue that it has low probative value. It moves the ball very little. There's other evidence that's at issue out there. We have stipulations. Uh, we have other witness testimony. Uh, it simply does not move the ball that much. It's not very probative. It has low probative value. I suggest that you need these two steps, and in this order, high unfair prejudice, high danger. This is really going to confuse the issues at trial. This is really going to waste the jury's time. Uh, and low probative value. <coughs> For what? Why are we going through all this? For what? Uh, only when you argue one and two here, high unfair prejudice or some other danger, and very low probative value that the proponent, the reason for the proponent putting on, can you possibly get near scales where unfair prejudice could substantially outweigh probative value. The only way you can get near the argument is if you push the left side up and the right side down and then argue, judge, this is the case. Exercise your discretion to exclude this evidence here because unfair prejudice substantially outweighs probative value. Keep these words wed in your arguments. Unfair always goes with prejudice. Substantially always goes without way under 403. If you keep it tight and keep those wed, we will know. Now listen, if you are the proponent, if you're the one putting on the evidence, you're necessarily on the other side of this argument. So think about it. It would work the other way. Your Honor, this is not unfair prejudice and it's not quantified as high as the objecting party would have you see, if there is any at all. And, Your Honor, we do have probative value. The probative value actually uh, is significant in this case, and here's what it is. So thus, it cannot be said that the scale looks like this. Unfair prejudice cannot be said to substantially outweigh probative value because I've shown the probative value is high and the unfair prejudice is low. Don't worry about arguing that the scales have to tip the other way. They don't. It only has to do with it doesn't look like this. The picture doesn't look like this. So keep your arguments. If they are the objecting party, you're arguing that the picture looks like this. An unfair prejudice substantially outweighs probative value. Judge, this is the case. Exercise your discretion here. If you're the proponent, you're saying that it does not look like this because the prejudice or other dangers are low, because the probative value uh, it, it, it is substantive. There is something there. So it cannot be said that the scale looks like this. It does not substantially that way. Do not exercise your discretion and exclude it. Hope that helps.